I'd been hearing about this saltwater fishing up in Massachusetts from my old buddy Larry Cronin. And when Larry asked like to come north and fish a couple of days for striped bass, well, that's like throwing an old southern cottontail into a briar patch. Before you could say Chappaquiddy, I was meeting Larry at the Harborside Inn docks at Edgartown on Martha's Vineyard. Now, Larry is a victim of bass fever, too. And for him, where the stripers are means Martha's Vineyard. I sure was looking forward to hauling out one of them big ones. The big fish are offshore in the rips, he said. The best chances for a big one was to try and troll it up. They say if you don't like the weather at Martha's Vineyard, just hold your horses a minute and it'll change. Man, was that October fog cold. But somehow it fitted everything I had heard about the vineyard. Talk about atmosphere. Any minute, I expected to see a pirate ship or a fleet of Viking boats come sailing through that curtain of fog. But no such luck. The fog began to lift and nary a goat showed her colors. Larry was more interested in finding a good rip where the tide kicks up a wave as it pours over a shallow bar. The vineyard has a lot of shallow places, and there are plenty of rips when the tide is running. Just off West Key Point, Larry found what looked like a good rip, and we dropped big rubber eel lures back behind the boat. In order to get the lures down through the current, we had rigged our trolling reels with 45-pound test lead core line and attached three-foot flexible wire leaders. This should put us down near the bottom where the big ones are, said Larry. Just keep pumping and be ready for action. We trolled back and forth, back and forth, along rip after rip, and not even a nibble did. But Larry kept looking for the fish, and I kept sitting in the boat freezing. <laughs> At midday, the weather began to clear up some, but we still had no fish. The best way to get a fish to bite is to make him think you just not paid no attention. Sure enough, there he was. Now that's what I've been waiting for. Before you know it, he's got a hundred yards of my line and Larry's hollering directions over my shoulder. One thing's for sure, he's no schoolie. He might be a Plymouth schoolie to Frank Wilner, but to me, he's a hoss. Larry maneuvered us out of the rips to calmer water. I sure didn't want to lose this baby. Peppers play themselves down until they can't fight another lick. I guess that's why we like them so much. This feller was no exception. If I wanted him, I had to whip him first. Now that's a fish. That's the big one I promised, old buddy, Larry said. Okay, pal, now it's my turn. You come down to Santee Cooper in Carolina country and I'll show you more action and more striped bass than you can shake a stick at. You don't catch striped bass in fresh water, he said. You mean white bass. Mm -mm. I mean stripers. You come south, buddy, and I'll prove it. The next month, Lair drove down to South Carolina and I introduced him to Tiny Lunn, who's not only one of the best fishing guides at Santee, but also one of the best race car drivers around. Why they call him Tiny, I'll never know, because he's about six and a half feet tall and weighs 270 pounds. A few years ago, Tiny came out of the Midwest, took a good look at Santee and said, man, that's for me. So he built this fishing camp across South Carolina, took up guiding on the side. Racing is still his business, but Tiny's idea of heaven is either being first across the finish line at Daytona Speedway or fishing for schooling stripers here at Santee. 
The next morning, bright and early, we headed out into the lower lake to search for school and strippers. We scooted over into a quiet corner of the lake and began with the school. He picked a hole where the water was some deeper and we began to jig, pumping shiny spoons and buff tails straight up and then letting it flutter back to the bottom. Sometime when the fish are laying up on the bottom, resting, jigging is about the only way to perk up their interest. Sure enough, there they were, tiny tied in the one that almost snatched him out of the boat. And then the bottom of the lake hit me. Before you could say, bet your bucktail, Blair was tied to another one. All of us had a fish on, and Tiny was skipping around the deck like an overweight ballet dancer trying to keep the lines untangled. Tiny kept urging us to get our fish in. There's a big school down there, he said. But Larry played his fish cautiously and finally landed a beauty of about 10 pounds. Larry had a surprised look on his face. They looked just like our fish at Martha's Vineyard, he said. We hunted a while for the rest of them and then gave it up. By late afternoon, the wind was rising, but so were the birds. And when the birds start flying, it's every man for himself. Chasing the schools at Santee calls for a fast boat and the fancy footwork of a convicted horse thief. You run full blast to the school, hoping to get in range before they go down onto the birds. Then you cast a couple of times right fast, catch fish if you're lucky. As soon as we pulled in close to the birds, Tiny and Larry cast their lures into the breaking fish. I had a feeling this was gonna be it. From the thrashing in the water, these were big fish. And bingo, Tiny got the first strike. And next thing I knew, Larry had a horse. I just stood back, giving him room. This was gonna be something to watch. It wasn't long Tiny he had his whip down and was bringing him into the boat. A nice school striper, about seven pounds. But Larry's fish was something else. When he rolled up and splashed, I knew we were looking at a big fish. One of the biggest I ever saw caught at Santee. And what's even more important, the fish were still biting. Old Santee Cooper was paying off. Once again, the old girl hadn't let me down stood there in the boat fighting another striper in the sunset. I know that in Massachusetts, South Carolina, or wherever, I'll always be where the stripers are. <laughs>